Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of the TDAM Talks podcast. Today, we are celebrating International Women's Day and Women's History Month. And this year, the theme for International Women's Day is Inspire Inclusion. I am thrilled to be joined by my colleagues and friends, Kim Parley, a VP, TD Wealth, and host of BNN Money Talk, and Priti Shokin, head of ESG here at TD Asset Management. Welcome. Thank you. Thank this you. Is great. This is so great to have you on the other side I, of the table, Kim. It is, and I have to say, I think this is the first time, and I'm not kidding you, in probably 20 years I've been in this side and not You've that been the side. So I much prefer it over there, but I'm anyway. I'm going to try and make this comfortable for you. So let's give our audience a bit more context. Maybe, yeah. Kim, let's start by you sharing your career journey and, yeah. and telling our audience a little bit about yourself. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I uh, am a single mom, a 13-year-old boy um, who is uh, awesome and is, can be all-encompassing. Uh, I joined TD about, I want to say 11, I think maybe it's even 12 years ago, which is crazy because I thought when I came, uh, you know, I just didn't think it was going to be this long when I met people who came in and said, oh, I've been here for 20 years and I'm like, what? And like, I'm one of those people now, um, which is great. I love it. Uh, I run a team called the Strategic and Editorial Content Team and really what it is is we're an in-house media group uh, and that our job is just to showcase all the smart people we have inside TD Wealth. So we have a huge uh, group of people from TDAM who we love and just bring them just and just, you know, these are smart people, come work with us. That's really what my job is, is just to do that right across the organization. So, and we, we put out, just for context, we have about 15 million views per year. We put out about 6,000 pieces of content per year. Like it's, we're, we do a lot. That is an incredible machine. Yeah. It is, and it's fun. It is. Pretty, tell our audience a little bit about your role here at TD. Not for quite sure. as long, not quite 10 years here, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah it happened, trust me. Well, <laughs> it may happen to me. You know, we, we won't speculate on that yet, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been three years for me at TD Asset Management, and uh, as you mentioned, Ingrid, I'm head of ESG Research and Engagement Team. Just on a personal side, you know, uh, we are a family of four um, and uh, with two teenagers at home, so a f almost 15-year-old and a almost 13-year-old. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we are an immigrant family, and the reason I'm saying that is because of the nature of this podcast, and yeah. I truly want to bring out some of the positives that come with that experience as well. Um, on the work side, uh, we are a team of seven, we support the investment team on ESG integration, stewardship, um, as well as thought leadership on environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, and I'm super excited to be here talking to you know two women who I strongly appreciate and look up to. That's fantastic. I want to dig a little bit deeper on the ESG piece because I think there's a really terrific dovetail here with the theme of inspiring inclusion, and that is a key pillar of, you know, when we think about um, the S in ESG. Can you talk a little bit more about your role on the investment team Absolutely. And, then, and how we apply that? Yeah, and it's a very strong pillar of our S strategy when it comes to company engagement. So typically we won't you know, pick companies on metrics that are related to diversity and inclusion and equity. However, we do believe that you know, it has to be included in every conversation we have with every company we hold in our portfolio and asset level. Uh, so not only on the public market side, but also on the private market side. Um, all the property managers that we have partnerships with, um, other investors, you know, we do look at, uh, you know, how they are performing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Female representation is a huge, uh, you know, topic of interest for us. Uh, one key thing we do uh, establish uh, in our conversations is when it comes to proxy voting, so we're shareholders in multiple public, publicly listed companies. Uh, you know, if, if there's not significant progress or we haven't seen um, a constructive discussion, we may actually vote against directors um, at the annual general meetings uh, based on our 30% uh, gender threshold. Um, yep. I want to scratch on that a little bit because when, you know, I think we've, we think about women in leadership roles in organizations and we always talk about the numbers. Can you talk a little bit about the power of having that diversity of thought at leadership tables and what you witness that maybe is a little bit different and why it's important? Because we always talk about the numbers, but I want to talk about the why. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we can get into the business case, but first I want to get into the equity case of it yeah. and the inclusivity case of it, uh, Ingrid. It's, it's just fair to have representation from a uh, specific you know, section of the population which is well-educated, you know, has higher uh, graduation rates, um, has higher grades uh, if you look at the metrics, 
and be represented in the workforce, senior management, as well as at the board level. Uh, so I think there's a fairness component of it, but from an investment standpoint, we also think that you know, that kind of diversity brings diversity of th thought. It hinders uh, groupthink, and it brings out also some aspects uh, which can be uh, extremely important for establishing a company or corporate culture. Um, it's you know significantly impacting some of the discussions that or decision making that happens at corporate level. Um, so I think you know from that perspective, it's uh, it's it's hugely important. You know, representation is important, but at the same time, you know, you talked about numbers. We talk about thirty percent or above all the mm -hmm. time. Uh, there's an that, important that critical mass that. piece. Yeah, talk about 30, that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, 30 percent uh, is something that has been well established in academia as well. That you know, out of 10, if you have one woman, that's not enough. Two is you know uh, still just representation. But when it comes to three or that 30 percent criticality, it, it's it's going beyond representation and influence? mainstream view. Um, yeah. So I think you know. It also uh, mitigates some of the risk that comes with you know, representation. Um, so we do believe that uh, number is the basic minimum threshold. It's not the ceiling. Yeah, it's, it is you know, to give the women the power of that, that voice in the room. I noted when you introduced what your role at TD, you said that you supported the investment team, and I think that's something we do as women. You're an integral part of the investment team, and um, but I do note that that's sort of a piece that we often do. It's, I will even say just on that point, it's you know that language shift, support to enable. Like I, yeah. we talk about our team, mm -hmm. and said so we're enabling them because it's a it's a core competency, right? It's yeah, pretty absolutely. integral to what you're doing right now. Yeah, you and I've talked pointing that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We watch sometimes in um, in research meetings, and our female analysts say we believe, and our male analysts sometimes say I believe and it's mm -hmm. there are these sort of micro moments that we witness sometimes and, and bringing them forward and helping either women have stronger voices for themselves or, or our partners recognizing the contribution we make is really important. Yeah. Kim you and I've talked about um, how you made the decision to come to TD and it was a little bit surprising. Can you talk a little bit about that because I think it really leans into that narrative around inclusion. Yeah it's it's funny because um, I'll give just a funny backstory that because um, I was a reporter and an anchor at uh, at the time was it was it was uh, BNN it's now BNN in Bloomberg yeah. um, and uh, I was on deadline I still remember this and I think um, uh, someone had called and uh, you know often what happens when you're in that position you're getting pitched stories pitched ideas and I was like I can't click I hung up on them like three times so first off that was the thing that I was like there was a, a level of uh, they kept trying which was really important just given my environment but what was interesting is uh, you know I, I went through a lot of time and interviewed a lot of people at TD um, and you know loved it was really excited but there was one part of the job that just was not going to work for me as a single mom it just wasn't going to work. And so at the, end of the, at the end of the conversation, I said, you know, thank you. I think it's a great organization, love thing, but I, I can't do it. And um, I think there was a bit of a, a pause and a bit of a shock when they said, and, and, and that was it. And then I had uh, someone uh, uh, in, in human resources call me the next day and they said, why? And I explained why and they said, well, what do you need? And I think I had never been asked that. You know, that was a real moment of like, what do you mean, what do I need? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, this has always been about what yeah. you need. And so um, I told them what my kind of my, my restrictions were around that. And they said, okay, well, if that's what you need, then let's make that happen. And I was just blown away. And I think, you know, that really matters. Uh, I mean, that was pivotal, pivotal in terms of what attracted me to TD. Um, and I'm not trying to be Pollyannish about this. It was really yeah. important. This is an organization that accommodated what I need. And so, you know, I think it's so important. And I tell this to not just women, but everybody. It's like, you got to ask for what you need. And then I was just telling you earlier, it doesn't mean you're always going to get it. So you don't want, you have to be very careful yeah. how to balance it, but you're not going to get it if you don't ask for it. So, you know, that was a really, uh, that was, that was big for me to understand that. And sometimes, you know, even what I needed, to be honest, uh, it shifted some of the strategy and what my team ended up doing. There's a real great thing that came out of it. We made a big move to digital content. You know, there's all sorts of things that came out of this. So it wasn't just this, to help this one person, but there was actually a business outcome that really supported it. And I think we've talked a lot about this because you and I have done a lot of conversations around women and, and the journey. And I've been on my career journey for well over 30 years now. And I often talk about the transition from allowed, we've been allowed to be at the table, mm -hmm. to we've been accommodated to organizations truly adapting. So even though sometimes the hills still feel steep, um, we have so much road behind us and yeah. I think we're in such a better place than, you know, than we've been for a long time. So I am 
consistently and um, enthusiastically optimistic about the future for yeah. women. I want to um, pivot back a little bit to uh, your experience with men and women from the side of the table that you're often sitting on interviewing. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about then sort of what are some of your observations about how women and men conduct themselves and, and some insights that maybe women would benefit from? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'm going to pull from my entire experience, not just because I've been with, you know, TD for 10 years, but before that I was a journalist for 10 years before that. And, you know, it's sometimes you hear these, these things that, you know, men are much quicker to kind of talk and much quicker to get to the table. It's true from the evidence that I've seen. There's a reason why people say those things. And often what I see is, uh, the women we've worked with and even some of the work we've trained with over the years is, you know, these are knowledgeable, powerful women who, um, you know, are slower to kind of have their voice heard. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, as knowledgeable, more knowledgeable sometimes than their male counterparts that, that are talking. And, I, you know, this is, this is something I said across, not just a TD, but from before. So I think there's been a lot of work in just helping uh, women learn how to get their voice heard. Uh, in a way, and it, it's been pretty powerful. The nice thing is, too, is that when we when this happens, you know, the power of actually getting women in front of people is other women see it, right? Mm -hmm. And then they and they emulate that. And it, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a story. You heard you were going to talk about your daughter, maybe, yep. and just say that it's not even a thing anymore, right? Like before, yeah. it used to be something we have to work before, and now it's just something that's taken for granted that women are part of that ecosystem that we see people speaking. Mm -hmm. Now you have to tell the story, but you, you do have to yeah, tell the story. Sure. I know, right? <laughs> no, just in preparation of uh, this podcast, I was talking. To my daughter yesterday i'm like i have this podcast tomorrow and i'm not really well prepared so she's like she asked me you know what questions are you going to get uh, and i mentioned to her that one of the questions i'm going to get is tell us about your career journey in a male dominated industry which is finance um, and she said uh, male dominated what <laughs> <laughs> and it just made me realize that you know she has no concept of you know having been in a male dominated industry yeah. and that's what i aspire for her right yeah. so it was very refreshing to hear that you know uh, probably her generation is not even going to experience any of this um and it's going to be you know just uh, an enabled world like ingrid yeah. very well put it yeah, yeah and, I, and i hope that's true you know that women that, that, that when people grow up they'll see that too but i do think though that we need to you know, not, not rest on our laurels either at the same yes, time, right? Things sure. can slip back, things can move in different directions, and you can see it with like political forces and other things as well too, like you've got to keep moving. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. What we can't believe could happen, yeah. it could happen. Yeah. Uh, I had two of our senior portfolio managers on this podcast last year, uh, Alex and Anna, and we talked about um, women and different decision making and different perspectives. So I want to sort of pull on that thread a little bit further, and I want to think about it in two threads, um, particularly around our industry. One is the um, the focus on financial advice and sort of the transition of our, our financial services advice from one that was historically transactional and very much about you know rates mm -hmm. of return to one that is more holistic and um, advice focused. So Kim, how, you know, from what you've seen, how do you think about the role that women play in our industry versus maybe a decade ago? Yeah, well, I mean, there's been a huge, I think there's a lot more women in the industry than there was yeah. a decade ago. So first off, you know, check, that's great. And I think, you know, uh, to give um, uh, credit, that you know, that I know in at TD Wealth Advice too. There's a lot more women now, uh, senior women in the field and more front facing, which has yep. been a big change. So that's that's great as well too. I think you know it really comes down. I mean, a lot of the work you've done as well, um, Ingrid, is just understanding that this you know women want a holistic conversation. Like the the investment management is is important in its core, but beyond that, people want to know. You know, talk to me as I said, like a single mother. Talk to me as a mom of a teenager. Talk mm -hmm. to me. Like, what are the things I need to be thinking about from that standpoint? Yeah. And I think um, you know that change is happening. Um, and it's funny too because I think you know it's important as an organization that there's two things that happen. We have to provide expertise in those areas of the things I just talked about. So you know, I'm a I'm a 53 year old woman, and you know, menopause may have come up once in my <laughs> once in my conversation before. But if I heard an organization talking about that and sharing some expertise, let's say about that time of my life financially, I'd be like, oh, check, that's mm -hmm. great. They, I, I understand that. Second, even just by v the virtue of them talking about it means they get me. And that's something that I think just has to happen in terms of how we do it. So I think there's lots of great stuff going on. I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah, and I think representation in any organization in any field is about creating a workforce that represents the customer, the cause, the purpose that you serve, and yep. particularly in financial services, we've talked about so many times, the share of the wallet is moving into the hands of the women and organizations have to adapt. And that's why it's been so terrific to see that real growth in leadership, but yep. also the education around 
how women can be so incredibly powerful in this role. I want to carry on that theme a little bit because I think as investors, mm -hmm. we're always looking for the big themes in the market that are really changing the landscape. And there's a lot of talk now about AI. Right, yes. so heavy technical. Um, we're talking about where the productivity gains can be found, but let's put a female lens on it. And I'll sort of, I'll ping you first on this one, Pretty. Yeah, I think, you know, just thinking purely from an investment standpoint and stewardship standpoint, I think, you know, the, uh, the key um, consideration or area of interest for me is, you know, how is AI being built? You know, what are the algorithms that are defining the models um, and, you know, the outcomes of, of those models? Uh, you know, is there an element of uh, empathy or the way females think about certain things as opposed to being, you know, very driven by, you know, certain models? So I think that's that's something that is super interesting for me. I know there's a huge group called Women in Tech that focuses on this particular mm -hmm. uh, topic. And uh, we as investors obviously want to approach it, you know, in our conversations with big tech companies, you know, who are building these models for the future. You know, it's going to define how our lives or our kids' lives are going to be um, looking like, right? So it's it's very important to make sure that these models are built right. We're including those elements of empathy. But I know Kim has many more thoughts on that. No, you know, no, and actually, but I think, you know, yours are the, the core ones too. It's like when you're building the rules of the game, you got to make sure the rules of the game are inclusive because they're yes. going to govern yep. the game for the next, you know, Absolutely. 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually the most important. And then secondarily, I would just say on top of that is, you know, as women think about their, you know, um, their success in this environment, their management styles, there's you know some some people thinking about the fact that maybe abstract thinking, interpersonal relationships, um, are, are skills they're going to kind of move up because uh, some of the other I'll say uh, technical, um, you know, some of these might get commoditized away, and we've yep. seen that with other mm -hmm. you know, and other things too. And some won't. Like I think, and honestly, people who say they know exactly where it's going don't. So I've heard from everybody on many many different things, and so. I just think there's. I think women need to think that through a little bit. There could be a real opportunity to show that 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 those kinds of skills and, and almost build on them and, and really you know show what they could be valued for. Yeah. So the shifting in the skill set yeah. through the commoditization of some of the things that were so dominant. Yeah. I think is going to be a theme that we see everywhere. And, and back to that um, sharing of things. And I'm not saying you know male thought, female thought, not one better, but the diversity of thought. Yeah. Inclusion, incredibly important. Um, we've talked about, when we were talking about gender inclusion, you've talked a little bit about um, being an immigrant. I want to talk a little bit about diversity by age or women at different age and stage in the career. And I'm sort of looking at the three of us and I think loosely speaking, we're all at, in different decades of our journey, likely. Um, Mr. Pretty, how do you think about it? You know, when you look at your career, when you look at women coming up or when you look at um, uh, older women that you've looked up to, what are some of your observations on, on leadership and yeah, I think, you know, one of the key thing for me now in my journey is that I'm much more settled, I'm much more patient, and, you know, I listen more. Uh, whereas early on in my career, you know, there was a little bit of that impatience, the drive to keep on going yeah. um, without self-care. So I think, you know, that's become super important for me as I have uh, progressed through my career. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, it's, it's at a stage where it's middle career. You know, I know what I want, um, the pace of that, you know, progression and self-care because, you know, it's it's so important for women to take the time and not have the burden of the world on their shoulders um, and really just, you know, sit back, think through their strategies, evaluate uh, when faced with a challenge as well. So I think, you know, those are some strategies that I have found very useful right now. But then some women I've really, really looked up to, you know, they are in their prime when they're in their 50s. You know, majority of that, you know, the, the family work, you know, the children are out of the house, you know, there's less distractions or, you know, pulls uh, on, on their time and their focus. So I think, you know, women in their 50s are actually now in their prime years for leadership, for making sure that, you know, they promote uh, a culture of inclusivity, mm -hmm. have more voices at the table, and uh, they're just mu much more, you know, thoughtful and uh, and and stable in their thinking. And, and just to say, it's funny too, because I, I agree with 100% of everything. I was just like, yes, 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 all the way through. And the other thing too, though, I think that, you know, um, I, I was, um, you know, didn't have children until I was 40. I was later and I, and I and had children later. And, but the one thing I've discovered with, you know, being a mother is it's, I, I hope it's all those things on good days, all those things you said, but also we get it done. 
Yeah. And I think that's something. I think that's something yeah. that we don't talk about that enough. Is that like you know, if I, I was going to say, if you need a job, you know, find a mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes to do that because they just know how to. They know how to get it done in the face of all the things that are going on. And I think that's something too. I just like I, I wish that that was associated more readily with because that's that's yeah. so true. I mean, you think about our days and just kind of what has to happen to get the, yep. you know in terms of things you have to do. And I, I look at both of you with teenagers, and I'm further on the journey. Yes. So I'm a bird launcher of four, and my baby's turning 25 this year. So I'm through that. And as you were talking, pretty, I thought about a male career journey as a sort of linear mm -hmm. piece. And I think about a woman's career journey as sort of like this, with maybe a plateau where there's some balance, and then an acceleration. And uh, I do think that you know a woman who's who's achieved a lot in their career when they're in their 50s and mm -hmm. the, the load that comes from the child care and all the research says yep. that women do take on 60 to 70 percent of the seas, the cooking, cleaning children, peace on the home front, no matter how balanced you are. Yep. Um, we are unleashed with capacity later in career. Yep. Um, and I think that's something, and I don't think, you know, I think people that look up to women like yourselves, to all of us, think, oh, it must have been easy. And we know that it's not. You know, mm. I think back to sitting on airport floors and snowstorms and missing children's birthdays because I was on the road. Yep. Uh, so it's, uh, it is fascinating, but it wasn't easy, but we're here. Right? Yep. And it was worth it every yep. piece of it. Um, talk to me a little bit about mentorship and sponsorship. How important has that been in your career, Kim? Oh, um, it's been so important. And it's funny because I think you get mentored and sponsorship not just from the people that you're working for. And I've been blessed with having some really great people to work for throughout my career, but also people that you know, you're working more senior and that you kind of interact with. So um, it's been really important. And I think probably the big thing is, is sometimes you know, those mentors and sponsors pushing me to do things that I didn't think I could do. Um, and what that opened up, uh, you know, and so I think that's just something I always try and keep in mind because, you know, when I have, and not just, you know, uh, people on my team, but just in the organization, it's like I, I try and kind of give them more than maybe they can handle because they can move up to that, right? Like there's, it feels good to be able to move to that, but you have to balance that at the same time with, mm -hmm. you know, being sensitive to what they have to manage at the same time. But I think some of the, the most, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth between the two, but it's like, you know, you want to be able to give people a great place to work, but you got to challenge them. And I think that's what I, what's what I value the most in my career was people who came to me with hard problems to solve. Was I mean, there a uh, difference between male and female leaders in your career? Um, we talked about this, I think, beforehand. And I think um, I've, I've had great and, and, and sometimes not so great on both, right? And I think, um, actually, I think you said it, so I, I don't want to, you know, take it away. But I, I look forward to the work the, when we actually have these conversations about. It's not about a female, uh, you know, uh, a boss or a male one. It's just your boss. A good or a bad. And that's no yeah. longer a conversation. Effective I don't or know. not? What do you think? Yeah, I think you know I've had both female and male bosses. You know, there are certainly differences, uh, but at least in my view, it's very hard to generalize, you know, because I've had really great, you know, male bosses who have been um, absolutely phenomenal and fantastic and being detailed and, you know, telling me exactly, this is what you plan to do to achieve this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I have had female bosses who have been great enablers, right? So they have said, listen, you know, I know you can do it, so you go ahead and, you know, pursue what you want to pursue and have given me those challenging assignments, as you yep. mentioned, Kim. Um, and put me out of my comfort zone, yeah. right? So you would think that a female boss would not put you in uncomfortable situations, but they do. And it's purely because of professional growth. Um, I've been an introvert all my life. One of my female bosses put me in a business development role. And I, as you can <laughs> notice, I am an immigrant in this country. And business development is not that easy in finance, and especially in asset management industry. Uh, for a person who's not been born and brought up here, obviously I have the expertise and education and training, uh, but that was really a huge stretch assignment for me because you know, being in front of people, trying to make sure we're presenting our value proposition in the right way, you know, almost in a consultant role. So I think, you know, not that I can generalize, but I think the, the role of your mentors and sponsors are so important. Um, just one thing I wanted to point out for the audience is also a little bit of you know, advice on um, not to look for mentors and sponsors just within your organization and having a wider network mm -hmm. because you know, I haven't had many formal mentors but, and sponsors, 
But at the same time, every time I needed a sounding board, yeah. you know, I've found people that I can talk to who can enable me to think differently about a particular problem or solution. Um, so I think, you know, expanding your network outside of your organization is super helpful. It also gives you more perspective. Yeah. Because an organization is geared to think yep. a certain way. Um, yeah. So I think you know, that's <coughs> really been helpful for me. And I would just add too that, you know, I think some of the more valuable conversations I've had, especially over the past five years, is sometimes the reverse mentorship. It's like where you're mm -hmm. getting mentored by somebody younger, earlier in the career. Like, <laughs> and, you know, and it's more yeah. kind of like, tell me what you see. You know, tell me because show they, me my blind spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and just you know, and I, I've learned so much, you know, and from that front too. But um, yeah, so I've been fortunate on that front. How about you? I think that um, you know, I've got four kids between the ages of, you know, in their 20s and 30s right now. And um, I am awestruck by the confidence, particularly of my daughter. And um, sometimes I will watch her and I'll say, I need to bring some of that, pardon my French badassness, um, <laughs> into my own role. Uh, I think women are empathetic leaders um, and we care a lot about our teams. And I, I think that's wonderful. I also think it's um, a burden that we care. A lot of research showing that, you know, in the times that we've had over the last few years, women and the folks they put on their teams and, and the way they're carrying that emotional load can be a burden. So I think a lot about that, uh, you know, and I heard you talking a little bit about this and the importance of self-care. Mm -hmm. I do think we have to recognize some of those differences in our, um, in our makeup that make us great leaders, workers, team members, um, and respect those and take care of ourselves. Yeah. Great conversation. I want to wrap it up with the last question for each of you. And you know, on the theme of inspire inclusion, mm -hmm. what would you say to the next generation of women, or what advice would you give um, to those coming up? Kim, um, first. I think I would just, uh, uh, in terms of for those who are building their own careers, is just you know, go for it. Like it's just you know, there's nothing. Like I'm not saying that it's not going to be hard. It's a, but like ask for what you want, ask for what you need, but at the same time, don't get if you get a no. It doesn't mean anything other than just change the channel, ask a different way, or get the feedback. You either get what you want with the feedback. But it was just, you know, keep asking. And I think also I'd say is be someone who's a clearing for real feedback. I think that's something that um, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one sometimes in, in organizations where I think people are wary of trying to, you know, be inclusive and say the mm -hmm. right things. But if you're somebody who can be what I talk about being a clearing for someone who will tell you what they think and really truly give you the feedback, it's such a gift, you know, and then you can make choices based 100%, on that feedback. Yeah. 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 It's really, like, that is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, maybe what would you tell your younger self? Well, I think um, my younger self, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell myself, be yourself, don't be scared, you know, uh, because uh, you're not, you're the judge of yourself, so be authentic to yourself. Um, you know, if you have the skills, the expertise, you know, that will take you a long way. And uh, being confident, I think that's that's extremely important. Um, yeah, I think you know, being being myself, mm. and a member of the investment team. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Kim. And actually, there's one more thing I wanted to point out. Um, and I think some some women, and maybe even some men, uh, are not the loudest voices in the room. Right, so they may, they may feel that you know um, their opinion or input is not valued, but those exact voices need to be um, amplified a little bit more. And I think you know, as a manager, I try to do that uh, within my own team. But that's something that I would encourage all women managers or even male managers to do. You know, um, there may be you know the softest voice in the corner, but that may be very very powerful and insightful on how things are going. If you whisper, people sometimes will lean in to hear yes. you, and that's an important thing. That's a great thought to finish on. Kim, thank you. Pretty, thank you. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed our conversation on Inspire Inclusion in honor of this year's International Women's Day. Thank you.